Okay, we got Sean Major here. Thanks. Hey, hey, first of all, we're pretty pumped to be here because we're out of Washington, D.C., but more importantly, we're here with you all. You know, I, I like to see some of the generals that used to work in the Army staff. We put them out in the field. They're always smiling no matter what they're doing, so it's, it's, it's really great to be here with you. Um, could I ask the non-commissioned officers that are here just to please stand up for me? Please stand up. Now, I'm with, here's the deal. The reason we are the greatest Army in the world is because we have the greatest NCOs in the world. So how about a hand for NCOs, okay? <laughs> Seriously, okay? You can sit down now, okay? I'll let you go back to. And, 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 I, and I really mean that. And, and do we have any senior warrant officers here? Yes, sir. Okay, come on, stand up, senior warrant officers, okay? And, and for the younger officers out there in NCOs, don't forget your senior warrant officers, okay? You know, I, I grew up in, in, in aviation, and, and, and they do most of the flying, most of the fighting for us. But, you know, for younger officers out there, you know, don't forget your non-commissioned officers and your warrant officers. They're going to help you do your job. And quite frankly, when we take a look at what's happening in Russia, I'm going to talk a little more about Ukraine because it's, it's really important that we understand what's going on and how that all fits into what we're trying to do in the United States Army. And, and that's why I, I am honored to have, you know, who I consider, if not the best NCO I've ever served with, pretty, pretty damn close, Sergeant Major Grinston. And I can tell you, he does an incredible job representing every single one of you all. He really does. He cares about families. He cares about soldiers. He's got incredible combat experience, and, and we are blessed to have him. Um, for the armor folks out there, armor is going nowhere. I mean, it's going places, but it's certainly, you know, <laughs> I, know going to, I, I bring that one back. And, and here's the question, you know, the good thing, you're going to have Jim Rainey talk to you later, okay? And General Jim Rainey is smiling too because he's a G3. He's out of the Pentagon. He's sitting right over here. <laughs> he's smiling because he's here with you. Uh, but if you don't know it, he was the main effort uh, battalion commander in Fallujah, okay? And what they all did was pretty incredible. I, I saw the question on, you know, Marines are getting rid of tanks and those, those type things. First of all, I will never comment on what another service is doing. I've lost our other services comment on what the Army's doing, but I will never do that, and, and we don't do that in the Army, is, is talk about other services other than the, the greatest Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps in the entire world. That's kind of how we do business. However, we want to make sure that we get the Army right. That's our job. We worry about or concern about what's going on uh, in the Army, and we want to do that. I, I think, Curtis, is a great um, name for a conference. We're focused on fighting tomorrow, right? So we gotta be focused on 14 September, right? That's tomorrow, right? And, 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 and really, it's a good name. I mean, a lot of times we say, we, you know, focus on fighting tomorrow, we're thinking 20, 30 years, but we need to be ready to fight tomorrow. And we need to be able to fight every single day after that. And never forget that. There's a lot of things that go on. Uh, when you live where we live, there's a lot of things that happen. People talk about things. But don't ever forget, especially for the combat arms folks that are here, officers and NCOs, and Soldier here, your job is to protect the nation and fight and win the nation's war. There's a lot of other things go on, but never forget that. And when you go into combat, the American people expect you to win. They expect you to win. Don't worry about the politics. Don't worry about you know this, this, and this. Your platoon, your company, your battalion, your brigade, your division, whatever it is, they expect us to win. And quite frankly, that, you know, when we send you somewhere, we're not sending you to participate. We're not sending you to try hard. We're expecting you to win. Because there's no second place or honorable mention in combat. And you're going to get a call like the, um, anyone here for the 1st Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division? Is Charlie Costanza here? I know he's going to be here later. Um, you know, we called them up. They, they weren't on the ERP, and they weren't on the SERP. And I called up the division commander, and I said, are you ready to go? He said, we're ready to go. And I go, I'm serious. Are you ready to go? <laughs> and we launched them the next day. They were gone. In fact, I was going to go down and see them, and so I made I was trying to get down to see them. They were gone so fast that I couldn't even get, you know, I didn't want to, I go, we'll go over the weekend when they're moving out. They had moved so quickly, I couldn't get a chance to see them off, so I had to go see them when they were over there. But, but never forget that. The other thing I'd like to say is we, we lost some great Americans this, this week. Uh, General Gain, Grange, some of you know him, had a chance to work from, you know, one of, one of the icons of, of the range, of really the Army, incredible uh, hero for our Army, uh, passed away. 
Uh, Arnold Fisher, some of you, you know him, he was a corporal uh, in the Korean War, but all the Fisher houses and all those type things uh, he did for us. Again, keep him in your thoughts and prayers. And finally, a personal friend of mine, uh, Jim Pee Wee Martin, uh, was in the 101st Airborne Division, and he served during World War II, and you know, and last time I saw him, he was jumping into Normandy at 93 years of age. I mean, this is the type of greatest generation. He just passed away. He was a little over 101. And so just keep all those folks in your thoughts and prayers. We appreciate it. Go to the next slide. So what we want to do, and some major are going to tag, tag team this, we're going to go back and forth, is make sure we all understand, kind of like level the bubbles on what the strategic environment is. And you go, hey, wait a minute, I'm a platoon leader. I'm, you know, a company commander. Do I need to know that? Yeah, you kind of do. You want to know where the country's defense strategy is or, or what we're concerned about, because quite frankly, we are an inflection point uh, in the United States Army. Those who have been here for the last basically 20 years, you know about counterinsurgency, you know about counterterrorism, you've got combat time, you've done a regular warfare, but we are switching to large-scale combat operations. And you know, I just saw the National Training Center, I was pretty excited, had a swarm of 40 unmanned aerial systems going down, you know, that's, it's a different fight. And quite frankly, you need to be ready for the fight that we're going to have, not the fight you may want. And so when we take a look at what the environment is, the words matter too. Pacing challenge is China. Those words are carefully chosen. It didn't say pacing threat. It didn't say enemy. It said pacing challenge. China is the number one concern because we're concerned about what they're trying to do with the world order that we all depend on. And we're worried about security. But they are a pacing challenge. And they have an economy that will match ours. We haven't seen a country that we may be competing with have the economy that can match ours. They also have a developing a world-class army and a world-class military. So we are current concerned about them. Um, Russia is an acute threat, immediate. And we're seeing what's happening right now in, in Ukraine, and this is a very, very dangerous situation that's happening right now. You know, you know, the Ukrainians have done incredible. I'll talk a little about what they've done, but it is not over, and it's far from over, and, you know, there's some things that are going well. We're getting a lot of lessons learned, but it's not over, and, you know, we're going to continue to support and do those type things, but acute threat. Persistent threats. North Korea has not gone away. How many people have been on the peninsula on the pen? Okay. It's a dangerous situation because, quite frankly, you never know what KGU is going to do. And we just have to be ready. And we're seeing what, what, what Iran, we've been playing, you know, playing with Iran, been competing or, or dealing with Iran for the last couple of years. Again, very dangerous situation. And when people say, hey, you're going to large-scale combat operations, you're walking away from insurgencies and counterterrorism. No, we're not. We have to be able to do more than one thing at once. And violent extremists are not going away. They're not going away, and we're going to have to deal with them. And so that's the environment that we're working in. Oh, by the way, COVID's still out there, and there's, there's a lot of things that we're seeing. Any Guard and Reserve here? Okay, lots of Guard and Reserve here doing incredible things. Um, but you know, we're still going to protect the homeland, and we protect the homeland uh, from a whole bunch of things. What I've seen our Guard and Reserve do, not only overseas, but in the homeland, is, is unbelievable. So we really appreciate what you all do. Every year I get up here when I speak, I go, this is the year of the Guard and Reserves because we're asking them to do so much. And then we ask them to do more the next year. So we really appreciate all you're doing too. Go to the next slide. Okay, next slide. You know, all of a sudden we're talking, oh, you've got to go back one. You've got ahead of me. Go back one. Okay, then go to the next one. Okay, good, we'll go to that one. I can do whatever slide. <laughs> I, I, you know, sometimes you get an order, you know, we kind of, that's fine. Okay. We're going to talk, and in, 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 I'll have a sergeant major jump into it. I do, it's really important uh, that we understand what is going on in Ukraine. And, you know, for some of the older gentlemen and, 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 and ladies here, you know, if you, if you look at how we develop the army we have right now, it, it was an army that was developed coming out of Vietnam in, in, the, in the late 1970s-ish. And what drove at that time was... The 1973 Arab-Israeli War. Think about that. 1973. I guess my, they don't like me talking. Am I doing okay? All right. <laughs> I'll keep. If you, I can talk louder if this mic doesn't. Can, can everyone hear me out there? Okay. So think about 1973. 
And what happened was that's what drove our thinking to come up with Airland Battle. That's what drove our thinking to stand up the, the, the national training centers. We built some new organizations. We built like Ranger Battalions and Special Mission Units and 160th. All these came out of lessons learned. And the big five, the weapon systems that we used, you know, the Abrams tank, the Bradley. When, when I was here in the infantry basic course just a long time ago, in 1981, there were three tracks in, in, in infantry. There was a light infantry, and you went to ranger school. There was an infantry aviation track, which I happened to go on, which went to aviation school. But there's also a mechanized infantry track, and they were going to this new vehicle called the Bradley, which everyone's like, wow, you know, and now we're getting ready to replace it, kind of. So just that's how things have changed. And that's how we built the Army. And quite frankly, we're, what we're going to take a look at, we're using right now is Ukraine as an example of what we're learning about large-scale combat operations. And some of the lessons, I just want to describe, mission command. We talk about it a lot, but we are going to have to change the way we think about mission command and command posts because the battlefield is so lethal. You know, a lot of us have had these uh, incredible um, op centers. You know, I, you know, I remember in, in Afghanistan driving, you know, flying around or driving around, and, you know, you got company, you know, op centers with stadium seats and big old, you know, television screens and all that stuff. That stuff is gone. And for those that haven't been to the, the training centers, we're going to make you move all the time. Because what the, what the Russians have learned, if they don't move their command posts, they're going away. And so you can have one for a while, but you know, you're know you not going to have time. And we're going to train you that way, so don't get excited if we're, we're moving you every two, two hours. The way to get smaller, leaner command posts is make you move all the time. And, and then you have to figure out that you know, if you've got to move, you're not going to set up the stadium seats, you're not going to set up the big tents, you're not going to do all that stuff. You're going to get leaner and meaner. And, and then you start deciding about who you're going to take with you. And so all that, and then you have to give different type orders because you're not going to be able to command and control in a contested environment where, you know, people could jam your radio communication, do all that stuff, so that what you really need to do is have highly trained, disciplined, fit troops that can execute on intent and do that. So all of you, and, and the reason it's excited for me, you're going to lead the Army into the future, and you have to be ready to do that. I talked about the NCO Corps. You know, when you take a look at the Russian Army, it's a conscription army. They don't have professional non-commissioned officers. You can't do mission command without great non-commissioned officers. It's just not going to happen. They got generals going to the front to try to get platoons and companies moving. That's no way to really, really operate. So we are blessed to have great NCOs uh, in, in our Army. The theater posture was really important. We are very blessed to have you know, great allies and partners uh, in Europe, very, very tight. We've, we've spent years working very closely together. So when this happened, we were able to do things very, very quickly and provide logistics. And, you know, there's the old adage about amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. If you can't do logistics on this uh, modern battlefield and you take a look at how much artillery is being shot and all the systems, I mean, it's unbelievable. You got to be able to move logistics. You got to be able to make those type of things happen. You have to be postured for speed. You know, I, I talk about the great uh, first brigade, the third infantry. We also had a brigade from the 82nd. They they drew from uh, pre-positioned stocks. Uh, you don't get an armor brigade on the ground in seven days without having pre-positioned stocks. It just the physics don't allow it. You got to put stuff on a train. You got to put stuff on a boat. You got to you know set it over there. You got to unload it. But what allowed that to happen? was the fact that we had pre-positioned stocks. And that's a starter. You know, you want to have, you know, a brigade worth of equipment over there, and then you want to make sure it's modernized, and then you want to make sure it actually works. You know, a lot of times, you know, you know if it's just a warehouse full of old equipment, that's not very helpful. It's got to be ready to go, and that makes a difference on the posture. And we have very, very strong relationships in Europe. You all have been over there. You've been training with our allies and partners. And, and quite frankly, I think NATO is stronger than it's ever been uh, in recent history, at least my, my experience. Um, operational lessons. You know, I, I hear this all the time. Here. We don't need armor anymore. We don't need that. I completely disagree. You don't need it unless you're going to fight, not fight. You know, and then you get rid of a lot of these type things. But again, our job is to be ready to fight. 
And those who have fought in various places and fought in cities and fought in places, you know, you don't want to be without armor. And so we're actually building more armor. You know, we're certainly improving our Abrams. We're going to replace the Bradley. We've got mobile protective fire coming on. We're going to have robotic combat vehicles, um, getting the MV. We are putting a lot of um, money into making sure that we can protect our soldiers on the battlefield. Because we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to go into these places and do combat. And so for those who have different opinions on it, I, I disagree. And, you know, it, we're going we're to invest in making sure that we can do combined, uh, combined arms operations. And again, if you just go with a, a, a provide um, one dilemma to the enemy, they can quickly take you down. That's why we do combined arms. Take advantage of infantry and armor and artillery and aviation and engineers, all the type things and bring them together. That is really important. And that's why we have to train it out at our national training centers so we're able to do that. We're able to do uh, wide gap crosses. We can make all that stuff happen. Here's something that really hit me and, you know, about when we're look at working with other militaries. You know, we kind of expect, you know, each country to be able to, you know, to be first to defend their country. And, you know, we have, um, you're going to be involved in training and advising and assisting other countries. But what we want to know is really four things when you're assessing another army. Do they have the capability? And by capability, do they have the right weapon systems? You know, the more modern weapon systems are really important. Do they have a capacity? Do they have enough of these weapon systems? And is it at scale where they can actually do the mission they need to do? Are they competent on those weapon systems and they can actually use them? And the last is probably the most important. Do they have a will to fight? And you know, I'm kind of, you know, in a position where having three kids in, in, in the Army and many of you have kids and a son-in-law and all been to combat, you know, if we're going to send our sons and daughters to combat, I expect them in their country to have their sons and daughters in combat fighting too, and they need to have the will to fight. So as I speak to a lot of my, you know, counterparts, it's like, okay, you know, you'll get our support, but do you have the will to fight? I will uh, say a little bit about the NCO Corps. I will caution you. Uh, we talk yeah, a lot about our NCOs, um, but to coin a retired general officer that just retired is uh, talking ain't fighting. So you got to earn it. Let me say that one more time. NCOs, you got to earn what they just said, that you're the greatest NCO Corps the Army has ever seen. You got to earn it every day, every week, every minute of every second. So don't just say, well, we're great. And did you get up and do that PT? Are you the absolute expert when it comes to an ear ambush, a far ambush? Are you the expert, absolute expert in your field? And if you're not, you better get there. Because when the, when the chief of staff of the Army calls the 3rd ID commander and says, are you ready, we're not going to sit there and go, man, I hope you know how to shoot the tank. It's not going to happen. And at the end of that, the bottom line that's a tank gunner sergeant in that tank. And you better know what you're doing. And you can't just say, you're, yeah, you're great, and go walk around being great. You better earn it every day, every second. And, it, and if you're confused on why I say that, just read the slide. Lessons from Ukraine. Yeah, thanks, Sergeant Major. I mean, you know, one of the things about our NCO Corps, which a lot of people don't know, if you're a Sergeant Major in our Army, less than 1% of our soldiers make Sergeant Major. If you're a Master Sergeant, less than 3% in our Army make Master Sergeant. So we expect a lot out of you. And I, and I, I appreciate Sergeant Major bringing that out, because we, we are going to expect you to be that top 1% NCO, or the top 3% NCO. And, and, and the whole, you, you cannot do Mission Command. People always say, do Mission Command. You got to do Mission Command. Who's, who's not for Mission Command? I'm, I'm also for, you know, like, solving world hunger. Um, but <laughs> if you don't have highly trained discipline, highly trained discipline and fit soldiers and try to do mission command, you will fail miserably. You shouldn't try it. Don't try it. And that's why Sergeant Major is going to talk a little later on how we're trying to build units from the bottom up and all those type things, but they matter. Precision fires. You know, again, this is something we need to get back into. You know, a lot of uh, us in Afghanistan 
and in Iraq and Syria and a few other places, we use fires, but we really didn't use them at the scale that they're being used at in Ukraine. And people talk about, you read the paper, they talk about HIMARS being a game changer. Well, imagine how much the game's going to change when we start putting prism strike missile capability on the battlefield at 500 kilometers best. We put attack them, so we put um, mid-range capability and we can sink ships at over 1,000 kilometers. And we put hypersonics, it's going to go thousands of miles. And all these things are going to be together on long-range precision fires with long-range targeting. It's going to fundamentally change the way we're going to be able to operate to set the conditions for future combat. So long-range fires matter. And for all the maneuver commanders out there, you know, if you haven't really you know, taken a hard look at how that's being done, we've got to get back into that. We've got to get back into you know, mass and fires. And, and for our artillery officers and fires, you know, you might have been a battle space uh, commander as a battalion company commander. We need to get back into fires and make sure you're, you're, you're masters of your craft because the maneuver commanders are going to expect you to be able to provide uh, those fires. Uh, I, I, the secretary talked about, you know, county UAS and UAS. And again, um, I, I challenge, I know we have some industry. I, I say this, one thing about the, the, the chief, I'm, I'm responsible for requirements. Uh, we're looking for innovative ways to defeat unmanned aerial systems. So all the industry folks out there, that is a place where there's going to be a lot of investment. It's going to be at er every place. I mean, from any place we have an American embassy at the lowest level all the way up to full-scale operations, um, we're going to have to deal with, counter with, with countering unmanned aerial systems or lethal drones. It's just going to be there. It's all over the place. They're lethal. They're being used for reconnaissance. We can see it in Ukraine, and we've got to be able to deal with that. Force protection is pretty much a given. I talked about APS and logistics. How many logisticians do we have out here? Not many, but we got, okay, we got some over here. Everyone's over, yeah, so, I mean, Sergeant Major, who, all right? I mean, logistics really matter, and, and the higher up you get, the more important it is. You know, if you ever study Eisenhower, Eisenhower, you know, was, you know, the theater commander, but what he really did was he did logistics. He took a look out there, and whoever was doing better, was it Montgomery or Patton, he gave him logistics, and that's how you did. So at our level, logistics really matter, and quite frankly, we have the whole army in support of the logistics in Europe right now. And, and, it, and, and that's where, quite frankly, it is making a huge difference. Uh, SFABs and multi-man task forces, we think those are the right way. We, got, we have SFABs right now. And any SFAB folks out here? OK, doing a great job. You know, again, if we're going to work with allies and partners, advising and assisting and getting them. And you know, the point that you know, I, I ask you all to do is help us out with the will. That's what we need to know. A lot of times, you know, we, we got to know if they have the will to fight, and that's how we need to be evalu evaluate units. And you all be able to do that when you're working very closely um, with these units. And then the, you know, the institutional lessons. We're starting to put some things in. We, we, we're going to come out with doctrine for multi-domain operations. That's been working. We got concepts. Now we're going to get into doctrine. And for the defense industrial base, we have a lot. You know, for, I see a lot of industry out there. We've learned an awful lot about supply chain. Um, management and some of the challenges we have is we, you know, we've got to have um, a robust supply chain. I heard the, the question back over there about you know, what are we going to do for older tanks and these type things. I mean, it, there's challenges. Again, it's logistics. And, you know, if we don't have the parts, we don't have the fuel, we don't have the repairs and all these, you know, um, these tanks and helicopters and howitzers, they just become paperweights. They're not combat vehicles. They're left on the side of the road. So logistics matters uh, when it comes to these type things. We talked about allies and partners, really important. And the other thing is, you know, we're still trying to get our hands on, but the Ukrainians are doing very well is when, you know, information operations. When you're trying to deal, uh, you know, uh, in battle, and battle is a battle of wills. And so wills are influenced by information operations. And that's something that we are working on and we need to get much better. We're much more challenged in a democracy because we just can't say or do anything that we want to go. Next, next slide. Um, call to service. The secretary mentioned it. I'm going to have side major talk a little about this on, you know, two things. You know, our army is people, okay? You know, we can buy new tanks. We can buy new helicopters. We can buy artillery pieces. But at the end of the day, you know, the most, our greatest strength is our people. And so... We need your help on 
helping us bring the best people into the Army, and you all can do that. In fact, interesting enough, 83% of the new soldiers that come in to the Army come from military families, 83%. And I signed all my kids up. I used to be the G1. I was in charge of recruiting, so I made them all go in the Army. And I'm out of kids, so I need you all to kind of help out with that. Um, and we are challenged, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. COVID has, has really challenged the kids in a whole bunch of ways coming out of high school. It's, it's really, we're seeing some, some challenges. The young men and women are having a hard time passing the ASVAB, and they're having a hard time, you know, being physically fit. And, you know, Sergeant Major and I and the Secretary, we've all made a commitment. We're not going to, let me say this again, we are not going to lower standards. We are not going to lower standards. I'd rather have a smaller army. To me, quality is more important than quantity. But we are going to recruit quality folks. And the one thing we've done, which we're starting to see um, uh, um, some real value in, we, we set up a future soldier prep course. And we're doing it at Jackson right now. I, I think if it keeps going, we're going to scale it, probably scale it here and then scale it uh, at, at, at Sill and, 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 um, and Leonardwood, and, and quite frankly, the results that we're getting so far, uh, you know, I don't want to oversell it, but it, it's fundamentally changing the way I think we're going to do business. And we're seeing young men and women, uh, you know, we, we had one person, I think went up, what, 50 points on major on the ASVAB? Uh, kids losing 2 to 6% body fat. And even more importantly, when we put them in initial military, in, into initial, initial military training, some of these folks were cat, you gotta come in and be at least a cat four to go. You can't be below that. And, but they are actually, after four or five, six weeks, they're taking on leadership positions in initial military training, which I think is pretty, pretty impressive. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that. Um, I've asked all our, you know, you're, if you're a soldier for life out there, I need your help. I need you out there inspiring young men and women to serve. That matters. And, um, and, and, and we're gonna have to, the other thing we're gonna do, and we're working with leadership, and you'll see this is, this is not a recruited, recruiting command problem. It's not a TRADOC problem, it's an Army problem. Which, in fact, some people say it's a national problem, but I, I only control the Army, so it's an Army thing that we're gonna get after at the Army level. But a lot of it is exposure. You know, we live in gated communities, they're hard to get on. We need to get out, let people see the great soldiers that we have and get them back in their high schools and talk about the opportunities. Because uh, they'll hear the things that aren't going well. Those things, you know, tend to, you know, make the newspapers. You know, we're almost a million person army, so every single day we're gonna have some challenges with some soldiers somewhere. But we have a whole bunch of people doing great things and we want people to give that opportunity. The other thing is, for commanders, I need you to retain all quality soldiers. If you're a leader out here, make sure you, you know, um, inspire other, inspire men and women to, to continue to serve because everyone that is qualified that stays is one less we have to recruit. So, Major, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I, I am going to keep my remarks uh, short so that we can get to a few questions at the end. But I'm going to ask you, you know, really one, you know, really request is, number one, have you gone and you've talked to your hometown or where you're from about the goodness of the Army? And I'm talking to this group because this side of the room looks a little bit younger than this part of the room. <laughs> and God forbid, in the back. So I guess all the second lieutenants raise your hand, I guess. Oh, yeah. See, I called it right there. So do you, when you go home, that's what we're missing. Have you gone and do you go home and you don't talk that you're in the Army? Or you go home and say, I'm really proud I'm in the Army. Which one is it? We need your help. It's not inside the gate talking to each other. It's outside the gate. They don't know who you are. And please, if you get a chance, talk about your enlisted, just a little bit. Just say, yeah, you know, they, we do not have the program where go to war, go to jail. We stopped that years ago. <laughs> this is a true story. Somebody actually, oh, you guys have that, and your enlisted can't talk in full sentences. Um, okay, don't question me. I'm from Alabama. <laughs> Roll Tide. Okay, calm down. Um, but what I'm saying is we need your help. Don't go home, take off the uniform, and don't talk about who you are. I don't need you to recruit anybody. I just need to talk about your service. And I need the younger generation to do it. We bought in, and, and I'll be honest with you, 
us talking to a 20-year-old, they just don't believe us. Um, we, I could talk to maybe the parents, but I, we, that's where we truly need your help with the sessions. And if you're a commander in here, maybe not the captain commanders, let your young lieutenants and your young captains and the sergeants go back and just talk at their hometown or where they're from to the community. They have no clue on what our army does on every day of every week to save the country. We still have soldiers in Iraq and Syria in combat right now. But you ask the average person, they have no idea. So if you want to serve something bigger than yourself, first of all, you have to know that you can serve something bigger than yourself. I need your help with the sessions just talking to our people. For the retention, our retention numbers are high. We're going to retain quality. Once people come in the military, they actually stay. It doesn't matter what you say. I've got the numbers. So it's true. We just really need to get people in. I need your help. Hey, thanks, Sean Major. I think, yeah, because, you know, in fact, I'm going to leave from here and, and meet with the community and talk to superintendents. We want to make sure that our recruiters can get access. And we get access. But as Sergeant Major said, more importantly, get a soldier that's from the area that speaks to, you know, I can go back to Boston. I got to, you know, I'm a native speaker up in Boston. <laughs> so I, I can do that. But, you know, there's other places where Sergeant Major would better the recruit. So getting, you know, this is talent management, getting the right person to go back. We, we had one kid went back, went back to his high school and en enlisted eight folks, you know. I said, leave them down there, let them keep going, you know, so, you know, we'll, we'll do that. But, but this is, I mean, this is really important. I'm really serious. We're, we're going to put a lot of emphasis over this over the next year to get after this thing because, quite frankly, when I look at the Army, we're in really good shape in a lot of places. This is one area that I think we, we need to improve on, but where, where we're going the rest of the place, I really, feel, I really feel good about the leadership. I feel good about modernization, readiness. We show readiness every day because we're launching people all over the place, but this is something that long-term matters. And we're in a war for talent, if, in, in, if you're a police force, you're an education industry, everyone's competing for talent right now, so we, we need to make sure we win that war. Next slide. And I, I, I'm watching the clock, so we're gonna move real quick through the, the couple of slides, because I do want to get questions. I talked about this, but you know, at the end of the day, what we want you to do as leaders is build cohesive teams that are highly trained, they're disciplined, they're fit, and they can fight and win. And any of these slides, if you guys want them, I'll get, you can leave them, you can use them, you can put your letterhead on them, I don't care, because I really want you to do this. We're trying to give you the answers to the test. If you do that, you'll be successful, and there's some behaviors we want you to avoid. And, 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 and Sergeant Major, you want to talk about why we talk about this, my yeah. squad, and stuff like that? Okay, it's pretty simple. Take every category um, that the Secretary of the Army laid out for us in those six topics. If you don't have somebody to your left or right that you can trust that's going to be there when your leg's bleeding, you've been shot at, you've been blown up. Uh, if you can't trust that person, you will not be able to, to protect yourself. You're not going to be able to sustain the fight. You're not going to go get the water because you don't trust the person to your left or the right. You know, so what people say, well, this people first versus readiness, it doesn't make any sense to me when people actually say that. If you don't have a cohesive team, it's going to be hard to fire a tank. It's going to be hard to provide fires. It's going to be hard to go on the objective. If you can't get in a four-man stack because you don't trust that person, how are you going to go into the room where somebody's trying to kill you? Oh, my God, I'm not going in there with you. I don't trust you. That's what we're talking about. And how do you know that person? Do you know that person that well? And I'm really proud. I got almost like 50% of my squad here with me today. I got this, it's just the first time ever. I got the Secretary of the Army, the Chief, and Dixon Carter. Is she in? Is she still in here? Did she quit on me? Okay. So uh, I'm only missing the under and the vice. And that's. Someone has to do the work. We got yeah, somebody's got to do the threes here, so I don't know who's working in the building. So <laughs> I'll be honest with you, hardest working general officer in the Army right there. Um, and I'm proud uh, that he's uh, kind of my neighbor. Um, but believe it or not, when I talk about my squad, he's not in my squad. So I want to be clear. Like, Sergeant Major, you just said this. So the people that know you, you got to trust them. And you got to know them. And I, I spent a lot of time with the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Under and the Vice and Chief Dixon Carter. And that's what it means when I say you got to know the people, and that builds a lethal force. Every 
greatest fighting force. They were lethal because they would die for the person left and right of them. And if you take that away, any of those priorities the Secretary of the Army laid out, it's going to be hard to accomplish if you don't trust each other. And that's how important this is. Hey, thanks, Sergeant Major. Just, just up, up here, and the golden triangle, building that golden triangle in your unit, and then making sure, if you're a leader, what we're seeing the most successful, they're not only competent, they're not only committed, but they have character, and quite frankly, they, they care about their troops. They get stuff done while taking care of their troops. And, and, and quite frankly, with the young men and women that are coming into the Army, you know, they expect you to take care of them and their parents expect us to take care of them when they come in the Army. Next slide. Uh, transformational change, uh, this highlights, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because I do wanna get to some questions, but you know, we're, we're changing our doctrine. We are going from air land battle to multi-domain operations. The, the, the big concept that's coming, at least for the Army, is Project Convergence. And in Futures Command, we'll talk about that. Um, Scott McKeon's over there, can talk about those type of things. But, but really, it's the ability to take multiple sensors and bring that information through uh, a, a command and control node and quickly get that to lethal means. And, and we're seeing this in some ways uh, in Ukraine right now, but what we're seeing is the speed, the range, and the convergence is gonna fundamentally change the characteristics of how we fight, not the nature. Nature of war doesn't really change, but the characteristics can. So that's where we're going. We set up new organizations. I just saw Jim Eisenhower was right there. He's he set up the first multi-domain task force. He can talk to you about what that means. Uh, we've got Don Hill over there, security forces, system brigades, these are real. We're getting after information operations. We don't have that right yet, but we're, we're working our way through that so we can do information operations on the battlefield. The training is this, the, the dirt CTCs are not going away. They're just getting more lethal. They're getting harder. You know, so for the younger officers up here, when you go to the combat training centers, don't let the old folks tell you they had it harder than you because we're going to make them really hard for you. So <laughs> you'll have that experience and you can talk about it. Um, and then, you know, but we are doing things, you know, with, with augmented and virtual reality. Uh, you're going to see this, this system, the IVAS, that will be transformational over the next couple of years, going to fundamentally heads up display, change the way we operate on the battlefield. We're setting up cyber ranges so we can test our cyber. And then our modernization priorities are, are, are listed there. Many of you have seen those. But we are really going long range. We're going to replace the Bradley. We're getting into robotic combat vehicles. We're, we're getting ready to field two new aircraft, the future reconnaissance aircraft, the future long-range assault aircraft. We're doing things when it comes to air and missile defense with lasers, uh, high-powered microwaves. We, we're bringing it all together inside the integrated battle command system. And then we're, 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 we're going to field uh, the next generation combat weapons, so for, for the close force, the close lethal force, that'll replace the M4, the SAR, and then with goggles, the enhanced night vision goggle Bravo, and, and IVAS is coming uh, to you soon, and, and the only thing I ask, if you get IVAS, the, the initial thing gets clunky, okay, and it, it's not quite where we want it, but it is transformational. It's very similar to the cell phone when it first came out. It was really big, or if you flew, you know, back when I was flying night vision goggles, and like 81, they were big full face goggles, and you, you, they, they, you know, how we flew with them, I don't know. We had like, you know, weights in the back of our head. It was really not very smart, but we weren't very smart then, and we just did it. But today, people are much smarter, and they don't do the things we would do. So when we get, so just, just stay with it. It's gonna, it's gonna change out. And then we're doing a lot of things in talent management. We're trying to get all three components. You know, that's the bane of my existence on one personnel talent management system. That's hopefully gonna be coming up in the next couple of months. And we've done assessment programs for all our commanders, so we make sure we have the right people in the right place. Next slide, and I think that's the last slide. And we'll take. Oh, this one real quick. This is just more a visual, so you kind of see the path. Um, for those, the, the older folks kind of know this. I, I mentioned it, but 19, came out of Vietnam. We saw the Arab-Israeli war. We came out with the airland battle, and that's what we used during Desert Storm, and it was very successful. I would say the same thing's happening. We're coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, although as Sergeant Major said, we are not out of Iraq, and we're not out of Syria. And we're looking at what's going on in Ukraine, and, and we're, gonna we're gonna come out with uh, multi-domain uh, operations, FM-30, uh, around October, and, and that's what we're gonna use for future fight. Next slide. And so, um, take this, sorry, May, you wanna take this one? Because this is about priority, you know, at least what we're, sorry, May's gonna talk through this, but you don't have enough time in your units. And what we're trying to advocate out there 
is we want you to use what, what, I, what I call the wedding cake approach. Focus for those who need, give the time and resources to those who need it the most, which is the interval squads and platoons and Sergeant Major OBU. I, I think it's pretty simple. If you're a second lieutenant or a commander or a captain in here and you said, hey, let's take this right out of 7.0 and take this and write this as your initial counseling with your first sergeant, your platoon sergeant, and say, okay, it says NCOs will do these things right here. This is right out of our doctrine. And have an adult conversation about how you as an NCO are going to support this effort. And you start at that building block and say, I am responsible in our doctrine and NCOs for individual small teams and crews. And have I provided you the best absolute soldier that can possibly be for your collective training? And that's in our doctrine. You could take this and write that out, pull it out of 7.0 and said, okay, are you doing this? Identify and train soldier crew and small team tasks. Sergeant, well, did a soldier not pass their PT test? Are they not highly qualified on their weapon? Do they actually pass their gunner's test? I can just keep going on. That's your responsibility as an NCO. All you have to do is take that, write it down, and say, okay, this is what doctrine says I need to do, and here's your initial counseling. Tell me you're gonna, how you're going to do that. Pretty simple. You get that right, NCOs, and if i got a good commander that counsels me on this, then all this gets easier. You don't have to worry about, you know, maneuvering and all this great stuff, or you don't have to go down and say, oh, my goodness, they didn't make the breach. The imp, you know, if, the, if they can't get to the breach and the Miklik doesn't fire because you don't know how to fire it, you can have all the plan you want at the brigade level at NTC. The whole brigade will go nowhere because you didn't get the breach open. Everything stops. I know, because I've seen it at NTC. General Taylor, are you with me? <laughs> right? The old breach is waiting for the, the Miklik to fire. What are we doing? They're all waiting, and they're still waiting. Did you provide an individual trained soldier at small team tasks? It's right there. It's in your doctrine. If I were you, I would use that as initial counseling with all my NCOs, and then hold them to that standard. That's how I see it. We'll build that base, and then we'll let battalion and brigade commanders get to the breach and figure out how to go all the way through the, the gap there. But you can't open the breach. You're never going to get anywhere. And, and Sergeant Major is absolutely right. You know, what we see, and again, you get do this stuff for 42 years, you see, you've seen a lot of units do things. And what we see is if you focus on this, that people are really good on the objective. You know, if you focus up here at the brigade battalion, what we see is people are really good at briefing and they have great rehearsals. We go, hey, great brief, great rehearsal. The leadership usually leads. No one, like, stays around except for the OCs to see how they are on the objective, and it doesn't go very well. We want you to be good. You know, we want you to win on the objective at the point of contact. And what we want to do is, you know, we got great CTCs. If you have time, train all the way up. But if you don't, if you have to take, you know, if you don't have enough time, that's on the priority. Go to the next slide, and we'd like to take some questions. I know we're kind of running out of time here, so we'll go ahead and take some questions, and we'll see how much time we have. We'll take some questions here, if you got some questions. Okay, no beards. That's good? <laughs> we'll, we'll take that question right off that bat, right? You know, we're good. <laughs> Sir, it looks like we have panel two. Please go ahead. Please make sure you speak up into the mic so that we can hear up on the stage. Thank you. Good morning, sir and Sergeant Major. My name is Signal Lieutenant Morrison. I'm sure that most people in this room are familiar with the article Lying to Ourselves, which highlights the Army has more days in its training calendar than, or sorry, more days of mandatory training than there are days in the training calendar. From the platoon and company level, many of these trainings are viewed as unnecessary obstacles to performing the actual training and preparation for war. I have personally witnessed uh, understrength platoons pull soldiers from servicing deadline tanks because of an online certificate uh, expired. And so I think myself and many others are wondering whether or not there's um, a plan to review all of the mandatory trainings the Army requires so that we can maximize the time for the squad, platoon, and company training. I, sir, I can go first on this if one. If you want to go, because I'll... Yeah, yeah, because uh, I'll be more, 
he'll, he'll say it really nice. I'm going to tell you very simply, don't do it. So, I mean, seriously, why? who told you don't do it? You're, okay, you know, you're the commander of your unit, not a piece of paper, an online class. You know, and we had this conversation. We actually did. This is a true statement. It was like, yeah, you know, we signed this letter. It said, don't have a corrosion officer in NCO. And both of us looked at each other and go, we never did that. And so it's like, he's my commander, you know, division commander. I was a brigade sergeant major. Set your priorities and say, here's what I'm going to work on. And somebody calls down the motor pool and says, go do that online training. And you're the commander of the first sergeant and said, they're not going to go right now. No, they're not going to do it. And who's going to? Is somebody going to physically come down there and take that person or not? No. So why are you doing it? So I, I'm being serious. It's like, Sergeant Major, is it that simple? I'm telling you, I've been this way for a long time. But what, I'm, what I, I really need you to do is, as a commander, set the priorities for your organization and then fight for it. And don't let somebody, and it's usually the staff, and it's not the commander. It was never the battalion commander that called down to your unit that told you to do that. So why are you listening to the, the S1? Well, sir. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's, that's an important question. You know, about two years ago, maybe it was three years, I can't, I, you know, we, we went through and, and the Secretary of the Army had heard company commanders and everyone, and we said, we're going to take a look. We looked at every requirement, you know, in the Army that people were, you know, and, and you could actually uh, volunteer requirements. And so we set out directives. I think there were 18 and 19 directives we set out. You're no, re no longer required to do this. And I looked at it when I go, wow. I, I, I need to go to confession. I was a division commander for three years, brigade commander for three years. You know, I never did any of this stuff. And, and I go, being people actually trying to do this stuff, then how do you get your, how do you build a cohesive team that's highly trained, disciplined, and fit that can fight and win if you're doing all this stuff? You don't have time. And, and quite frankly, this is where the senior leaders have to come in. And this is where you kind of do little things like back briefs. You know, I told you to do this, and I don't have enough time. So what do you want to, you know, here's the thing, sir, I can do this, this, or ma'am, I can do this, this, and this. You need to tell me what you want me to do. And that's why the, the chart with, you know, the, 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 the wedding cake is really good after priorities. And I have a balance chart, too. What, what we have to do for junior subordinates is, is give them our priorities and make sure that they have the time and the resources to do it. And if you don't, Go back to what you know, Sergeant Major and I said is, hey, what are you doing to make sure that you're trained, disciplined, and fit? Are you doing PT? You know, are you, are you making sure that your squads can do a night live fire? And maybe you don't have enough time, then you do a platoon live fire. One of the best examples, anyone here for 134 Red Bulls? Okay, over here, so I keep talking about you guys, because you, you guys are a great example where National Guard unit, um, not only, you know, if you, if you know the challenges National Guard units have is that they don't have all the time, they've got, you know, civilian jobs and all this stuff. They're also involved in George Floyd, you're on the streets in Minneapolis doing all that stuff, you're fighting COVID, and they went to the National Training Center. And what they did is they came in at, at a platoon level of proficiency. They had really good platoons. So they had good squads, good gun, you know, whatever. They just didn't have time to get the company or battalion or brigade, and they did some of that stuff. And the CTC did a great job of, of, you know, they exponentially increased while they were there, went off to the Middle East, one of your battalions ended up in, at HKI, and it was just an incredible, your battalion? All right, there you go. See, that's a true story. I'm not making it up. You always got the people here to make sure it's true. No, but, but that's the whole point, is they got their priorities straight, because what happens is if you don't get your, your, your squads, platoons, and companies, what happens at the CTCs, it becomes consequence management. You've you got vehicles overturning because people don't know how to drive, they don't know how to shoot, it's negligent discharges, people are running over there. All these little things that happen where if you don't have people that know their jobs, they can't do them. And if you're going to manage risk, and that's what we do in, in the Army as we manage risk, is invest where you have the biggest challenges. 
That's your 17 to 24 year olds. They're coming in out of initial military training. They live in your squads. They quite frankly, negligent discharge is waiting to happen. And you got to bring them in, you got to train them. And then when you get them trained, then you get platoons trained. And when you get platoons trained, you get companies trained and, and you can do, you know, uh, collective training up and down. But if you're focused on doing, you know, back in the day, you know, we do a division warfighter and you'd have all your platoons and, and, and doing pucking on the computers, you don't get good at that stuff. You got to get them good at what they're going to do in combat. And, and that's what we're trying to, you know, we're telling you to do it. And what we need leaders to do is make sure it, it's actually getting done. We talked to every pre-command course about that. We talked to every single leader. We go around and check that. But it's division commanders and brigade commanders are going to make sure that's happening. So, okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, we'll go back out to the audience. We have panel number one, please. Thank you. Yeah. Morning, sir. Uh, Colonel Chris Bartos, 20th Smirky Man, G3. Thank you for your time today. So we hear a lot about initiatives to protect and counter our force from UAS, cyber, counter information, disinformation. O over the past several years, the world lost millions to a global pandemic. All four of the countries you listed on your second slide have huge stock stockpiles of uh, cyber uh, threats. Do you think the Army is moving in the right direction to create initiatives or protect our force for the current and evolving cyber threats that we'll see in the future? I think we have more work to, you know, sorry, man, you talk about the individual from, you know, we're definitely, this is the shift, you know, I, I don't know how much um, Saberni training we did in Afghanistan when I was there, you know, if you're lucky to find some with a mask or, or, or some of the other things, even, even in Iraq after, you know, the initial stages. So I think it's something that, you know, for commanders out there, when we take, the reason we put out the national defense strategy, the reason we put out what the threats are or what the pacing challenges are, and we align trade off and we align doctrine, and we align our CTCs, is so we start training that at a level where we need to do it. We don't have enough time, but I believe, as, as you said, Saberni is a threat, uh, certainly in some of the scenarios we're gonna see, and we gotta make sure that we are modernizing and training that just, just like we, you know, uh, like any, any other um, threat that's out there. Sergeant Major? Yeah, yeah very quickly is, um, at some point in the Army, for all the right reasons, we took away all your 74 Deltas out of the company battery troop level. Um, we didn't put them all back in every unit, but we did try to put them in certain uh, elements. So you actually have somebody that can work on those capabilities. And, and one of the real reasons, uh, there is a, you know, the breaking of the seal of the mask with a beard. It, it's a fact, you know, look at a firefighter, you look at anybody, we need to train that task and uh, I am very fearful that if we get in a, in a uh, completely contested suburban area, we have soldiers that aren't going to be prepared to put on your mask. So when you go to NTC, it's gonna, it's gonna, you're probably going to be in Mop 4 at some point. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. So, uh, so that's actually in the, the National Training Center. And uh, one of my favorite stories is Adam Nash. Is he's the third CR Sergeant Major. And I'm visiting him as a force captain sergeant major. He's like, okay, sergeant major, I can't talk to you in this mask. So I said, well, let's have a conversation and take it off for a few minutes. So you're going to, we are training those things at the NTC, but I'm sure Sergeant Major Sims and General Poppins will talk about what we're doing specifically. But from our end, I was trying to give you and tried to give you the capabilities at the company battery troop level to have an expert, at least 74 Delta, that has somebody that could help you out with that. Gentlemen, we have time for one more question. And I got panel three. Please go ahead. Well, wait a minute. You got, we got time. I think we do, right, Mr. Chief? Sure, That's we got as much time as you want to take. It's good to be I chief. I can explain okay. to you, sir. Let me talk to you. We'll go one there, and we got one over there, if that, if that works for you. <laughs> OK, we'll, we'll be OK. We'll be right. <laughs> go ahead, over there, and then we'll go over here, since he was. Good morning, sir. Sorry, Major. Uh, Captain Beck, MCCC. Um, so the 18th Airborne Corps and MCOE have had their own idea competitions. And I know that Sergeant Major has, I guess, his team monitoring the Army subreddit. Um, are there any plans? <laughs> are there any plans to formalize the idea competitions similar to Soldier and NCO of the Year competitions? Yeah, so uh, that actually is a really good question. So what we do, 
I think we kind of already got it formalized, but I, I think you're right. We need to do maybe a little bit better. So we don't have like a worldwide competition, but what we do is every year, believe it or not, when the SAR majors come together last year, we proposed them questions in June. And that's where we went to Reddit and said, hey, what, what are the topics that we need to talk about? Um, so we come and, uh, ho and then we bring in soldiers and try to get those ideas. And then out from there is an out brief uh, to the senior SAR majors. And then every month after that, we try and pilot some of those ideas. And then eventually, if it's really good, then I will propose a change to something uh, in the Army. And I'll give you an example. Uh, first ID had 100% wellness checks uh, in the Army once a year. Doesn't matter who you are. But that's not a complete Army program, and that's an idea. And I just propose that, um, that we, as the Department of the Army, take that on on how we can do wellness checks. That's just on a behavioral health side. But the technology that 18th Airborne Corps has, they'll propose that in that monthly meeting, and we're taking that uh, technology for some of the things they're doing that way. And then I'm sure AFC has all the other stuff, and I'm sure, hopefully, that Sergeant Major Hester can talk about that at some point. That's the quick answer, yes. But we could do better, I think. Um, at getting some of those ideas. There is a mechanism for the enlisted side to get them up to the part of the Army. Um, but the, those programs are alive and well, and I know AFC has in a way for that, too. Sir, Next question, please. Is that the, the final question, right? Number one? Okay, you're the final question. Good morning, sir. Sergeant Major CW5 Harlow Aldacoa. My question for you is, how do you see the future of the Army warrant officer? Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think we're blessed to have warrant officers in the United States Army because the expertise uh, that you provide is absolutely critical to everything we do. And that's why a lot of times I recognize, you know, warrant officers. I, I grew up in, you know, in, in some special operations units and, and, and you know, when you're in, in aviation units where warrants are absolutely critical. And those who don't really seek them out and take advantage of their expertise and their leadership, not just experts, um, but their leadership are, are, quite, are quite frankly uh, losing out on an incredible opportunity. You know, and as we go to, you know, talent management, you know, there's always the question of what is, you know, what does the warrant officer corps look like? I mean, we know why we have warrants is because we want folks that have expertise and we want them to do what they're doing and be able to continue to do that. You know, I, I know aviation very well, but, you know, we have a very different model for aviation than the other services do because, as you know, they're up or out. And so in the other services, you got to be a captain or above. You don't have, you know, you might, you know, get a job in a, in a flying squadron, but you don't do much of that flying anymore where, you know, we, we have great warrant officers to fly for 25 to 30 years and they've been hitting roofs and shooting rockets for a long time and they do it extremely well and that's what they want to do. And I see the same thing in other fields uh, where our warrant officers are absolutely key to do that. So, you know, as we move into talent management, a lot of these times we're, we're bringing, we're coming out with new fields and, you know, it's artificial intelligence or it's coding or it's this. And so what's the right type of people that do that in the future so we can pop properly compensate them for what they're doing. I'll give you an example of a mismatch we have right now. We have a E4, Specialist 4 medic in a software factory. That medic codes at the PhD level and we're paying him as an E4 in the Army. Probably not fair, you know, so we got to figure out how we do that in the future uh, to, to take care of them, okay? All right, so I'm making final words before we close out here. Yeah, I, I do want to just thank, um, and um, I can promise you, as the Sergeant Major Army, this is going to be my last uh, maneuver conference. Um, that's it. I'm, I'm sorry about August. I'm dapping out. So, um, and I, I want to say this, this conference has grown um, year after year, and I still remember as a young artilleryman, um, and please, if you're the fires, don't hate me. But this is where we got a lot of the information about where the Army is going. And I've been adamant, I've tried to be a, um, a consistent participator of this event because it's just phenomenal. And I think this is probably one of the best ones I've seen. 
So uh, as this, as I go through my last one here, I can honestly say I'm proud to be your Sergeant Major of the Army, and I'm actually really extremely proud that you have all welcomed me at this event, uh, even though I'm one of the three artillery guys in the room. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of what you do and the hard work that you do for your Army and your country every day, and thank you. How about a hand for the Sergeant Major, yeah. okay? Thank you. Yeah, you know, let, let me just, you know, as I look around the room, you know, I see, I see Marines, our joint partners here, and, uh, you know, very, very important. We, we, you know, we always, you know, kind of talk back and forth between the services, but we're going to fight as a joint force. So that's really important. So take the time to get to know, you know, perspectives from each of the services. You know, each of the services has, you know, a, a mission. You know, sometimes we overlap, sometimes we do the same thing. Uh, but each of our services is the best in the world. You know, don't ever forget that. And we're all on the same team, you know, except sometimes when it comes to football games and, and things like that. Uh, but we are all on the same team. And the same thing as I look around the room, I see a lot of allies and partners here. Again, building relationships with each other. You never know when that's going to become really important. You know, many of us have been on battlefields and places where all of a sudden, hey, I knew you from here, we're in the same class together, or I know this person that knows that person. And, you know, as I've traveled around the world, and I do a lot of that, uh, those allies and partners that either we've gone to their schools or they've come to our schools, we're, we're, we're in a much better place. And, you know, just, just like the Sergeant Major, we're, we, you know, he and I are kind of going to finish this uh, marathon together uh, next, next August. And, you know, I, I truly believe that this Army uh, is, is in great shape. It's ready. It's getting modernized. You're going to see things coming in next year, you know, we're, we're, we're delivering 24 new systems. And so for the young officers here, you're going to see an army that is going to be f uh, fundamentally transformed over the next five to 10 years. Very, very different than what you see. Uh, we're real proud of uh, everything you're doing. Um, you know, when you think about what you've all been through, you know, through COVID, you know, a lot of, there's other armies out there that just shut down for, you know, two years because of COVID or didn't do anything. And you've continued to train. You, you, you continue to deploy and, and, and thank your, your families for me because, you know, we know what it means to uh, send you all off and you, you've all been gone a lot. So just want to say, Sergeant Major and I are uh, extremely proud of everything you do and we're just proud to serve you. Thank you.